what's going on guys welcome back to this video today we're going to face one of the most insane machines on hack the box the machine name is laser so why am i doing the machine today if you have been following my youtube channel and watching my youtube videos you will know that we are doing intro to printer exploitation track and in this track we have this insane machine kind of insane machine um it's the name is laser so let's get started so because this is an insane machine and there are a lot of obstacles and things that you need to do over and over i'm gonna do i'm not gonna do the machine live i'm gonna walk you guys through the steps that i have taken in order to achieve root on the machine the first thing i did all the time as we usually do it's the in-map scan we discovered a couple open ports we have 22 for ssh it's not gonna be usable for the current moment and uh, we have 9000 and uh, we have 9100 jet direct jet direct is the name of the printer so knowing that we have a printer running on port 9100 we decided that we should interact with this printer how we will interact with the printer again if you are watching my youtube videos on intro to printer exploitation you will know that there is a framework called pret so with Brett, we'll be able to interact with the printer using one of the languages that is used to enable the interaction or the smooth interaction between the user and the hardware of the printer. So basically, as you can see, I used this command. I supplied the IP address and the port and then PGL. Basically, in this case, we talked about this, guys. If you want to know what are the current languages the printer speaks, you can get back to uh, or you can watch my intro to printer exposition hack the box track uh, i'm gonna put the description the video the, the video link in the description and you will be able to see why we chose why we, what are these languages pgl postscript so on and so forth i'm not gonna i reiterate them guys i'm sorry so we try with pgl and it works as you can see here we have the banner laser corp laser jet for the for ml okay guys as you can as you know guys we explained again in the previous videos that we type question mark to retrieve the list of the commands so we decided to use ls to list the current contents of the working directory as you can see we have pgl we see you to pgl and we have jobs jobs is a directory that contains uh, the currently in queue jobs print jobs or the jobs that has been finished so we see the two jobs and we have a file called queued so curious enough we get the file to the local machine get queued and we have the file now on my local machine so we issue the command file queued to understand the nature of this file and we get this queued ascii text with very long lines 65,536 line with no line terminators so what i decided to do guys i make I made a copy of the exact same file into a new file queued modified it looks like we're gonna get our hands dirty with this file so let's do that on a copied version okay now basically if we open the copied version queued with mouse pad all right let's close this one let me show you the original file first the real file is queued, we open with the mouse pad, and as you can see here guys, the page 64 encoded. So you might be saying, oh, let's do page 64 D, and we're gonna get the contents of this file. It's not gonna work here because this is an encrypted page 64. How do I know? Of course, I tried to decode this file, but it didn't work. So basically, as you can see, first th first thing to do in order to decode this file is to remove the Python uh, bytes. As you can see, we have to remove this B code and at the very last remove the code from here after the queue okay hope this is clear after they remove the single code from here and the, C, the b and the the the, the python uh, byte here close this file okay and make a copy of the modified version so this is the modified version queued modified base 64 okay now what we're going to do yeah we're going to go ahead with you with your suggestion guys and use base 64-d so cat Basic, and then we pipe the output to base 64 d so it performs the decode process and then we put the contents into a new file called queued decoded we assume that the 
file has been decoded by the command base 64 okay so what happened here let's go ahead and find and take a look at decoded so decoded was somewhere let's see where is decoded it's not here but let me show you what I did so basically here okay so this is the decoded file so what I did I want to understand the nature of the file so I issued the command file queued decoded and I received data so if you try to open queued decoded after you issue the base 64 it's not gonna give you anything I mean the base 64 string it's not gonna decode into some ASCII string okay that's why we wanted to understand the nature of the file so we issued the file command was not sufficient so we wanted to take a look at the header of this file using xxt which will give us hexadecimal representation so xsd on this file and we get the header as you can see it's not clear what's the nature of this file so when we encounter such a scenario okay it's safe to say that this file is encrypted so this is an encrypted print job normally when a printer encrypts the uh, the print jobs it encrypts them using the AES algorithm okay I'm gonna assume that you don't know this guys so how do we know that this is an encrypted with AES so we go to the framework to the print okay again one more time we connect and we take a look at the environment variables by taking a look at the environment variables, we understand the configuration of the printer. And therefore, if there was an encryption applied on the printing jobs, it's going to be, it should be clear here. So we scroll down and we see this line. L parameter encryption mode AES CBC. So it means that the encryption, the printer is applying AES to encrypt the print jobs and other aspects. Now the thing with AES encryption is that in order to decrypt this file we need to retrieve the key now the thing with AES encryption is that the key is stored take a note of this the encryption key is stored in the memory so the only way to access that key is to get access to the memory luckily for us the print framework enables us to use the command nvram to access the contents of the memory therefore if we execute nvram dump we'll be able to retrieve the key and as you can see we see the string key and we have the key here now the complete string of the key you have to remove the two dots here and you will get the complete key so that's the key with the exception of the two dots so now we got the key guys and we have the encrypted file it's time now to perform the decryption process how do we do that we're gonna need to write a small simple friendly python script to do that so basically the script i created is here you can find many online examples of how to decrypt uh, aes with python so basically uh, let's see aes cbc decryption let me give you so it's with python as you can see here so we import base 64 because we're going to do this note that the script will be applied on the original file not the base 64 one okay now as you can see we import base 64 we're gonna, because we're going to use it and then from crypto cipher we import the eas because we're going to apply the decryption on this algorithm now we open the file let's make this bigger So here we have to make this bigger. Select font. Yeah. So from here, as you can see, we open the file queued and in read mode. We read the file and we assign the contents that we have just read with the, to the variable RF. So read file, the contents now of the encrypted file is stored in the variable RF. Now we do some sort of splitting on the file because we want to get rid of the python uh, first byte so we assign that we're going to split with single code and the first position and then we assign the uh, result to data now data contains the uh, base 64 string in queued without the python python byte okay all right so now we have the data what do we what do we do here we decode as we did earlier we need a decoded form of the file so we use base64 p64 decode on the data and we assign the contents of the base64 that has been decoded to the q row 
now we have a queued row file that's a variable name of course in AS encryption we need initial initialization vector which is the first 16 bytes and then the cipher and lastly from the decryption we assign the AS as the algorithm and his, this is the key here guys you know what we got the key right and we give the initialization vector and the algorithm and lastly after the decryption is performed using AES.decrypt cipher we assign the decrypted content to Q plane now that's the variable we contains the decrypted contents how do you open the file we first don't we don't know what's the file that we will get after the decryption process we're going to do we're going just to open the uh, op assign the uh, this as you can see we name a new file Q decrypted okay and we write the contents of a Q plane here to QDIC so Q decrypted after we take a look at the Q decrypt is a PDF file now this PDF file contains um, some guidelines on a service that's running on the printer it runs on port 9000 we have seen this before as you can see there's a service running on 9000 so we're going to take a look at this document and see how we can interact with this service to get a shell Okay, as you can see here, guys, the port 9000 running a service called Feed Engine, as you can see here. Apparently, the Feed Engine receives feeds, right, from the cloud, from printers, web servers, embedded devices. So, the feeds that it receives can be used to perform some health check, status check, uh, load balancing, so on and so forth. So, it's kind of a service that is responsible for um, displaying or giving the administrator metrics about the network the name of it is feed engine and it is installed or it's running on port 9000 as we see here and um, peer the document as you can see here so our job now is to find a way to interact with this feed engine So it says here to streamline the process we are utilizing the protocol buffers and the grpc framework now the grpc framework in order to use that framework we have to first install it on my machine we're going to do that and let's see we defined print service which has rpc method called feed the method takes content as an input parameter and returns data from the server the content message definition specifies a field data and data message okay on successful transmission we should see message pushing feeds all right that's useful here why because ultimately guys we want to find a way to interact with port 9000 it looks like this port is our way to get the shell so if you want to transfer reverse shells or any contents malicious content you want on the machine the only way to find out if this was successful is to look at this we should receive pushing feeds now but where should we receive this we're gonna have to create a client and server because this model is based on a client server so first we have to create a client client uh, script to interact with the server running on port 9000 now if the server why we interact with the with the server using the client if the server says pushing feeds when we push some requests it means that the request is successful QA with the clients, okay, bugs, todo. Also, this one is going to be useful. Merge staging core to feed engine. This one is going to be useful. It doesn't make sense now, but later you're going to see it's going to make sense. All right, so what do we do here? We're going to first get ourselves familiar with the RPC. 
So let me refer you guys to this link. Here is an introduction to the gRPC. So as you can see, guys, gRPC uses protocol buffers to define interfaces and the messages that are exchanged. So it means gRPC allow clients to interact with servers even if the language is different using something called the proto request. Ruby client, Android Java client, C++ service. So client and servers can interact with each other using different languages. The intermediary will be the gRPC protocol. So it's very useful protocol guys, indeed, to uh, facilitate the interaction between client server models that need um, different or that are using different languages. And with this link, we're gonna be we're gonna see an example here on how to find a way to interact using the gRPC. So this is an example to create a gRPC client. Okay. So what we have to do here is to create a simple proto file. As you can see, we need to the request will be proto proto request and proto response. So we have to make a proto file. This proto file will handle the uh, send and the send and receipt of the requests so how do you create this file as you can see guys the syntax can be taken from here so the, i created the file here let me show you the file so let's scroll down to see where is the file laser the proto open with the q pad with mouse pad as you can see this this file is simple we define the syntax to be proto3 and then this content can be taken from here guys as you can see here the syntax is proto3 and the rest is obvious let's scroll down so that's the file that we will use to interact with the uh, server running on port 9000 now the next thing is we want to find out a way to refer this proto file okay and use it with the gRPC tools so gRPC are a suite of tools that can be installed on Kali Linux how do I install them because you I'm gonna show you guys how did I install it because you might encounter some problems let me see here okay let's see here I don't think it's here let's see this tab all right, so sudo python3 dash m and we specify the package name. The package name is grpcio dash tools. That's the package name. And if your system doesn't accept external packages, use the switch dash dash break dash system dash packages. Using this command, you're going to be able to install the grpc tools. Okay, once you do that, the, the suit will be ready for the usage. The usage is like this. So let's let me show you guys what I did. So once we install the tools and we have the prototype ready, it's time now to interact with the server. Following this example here, we were able to create the laser.proto file. This laser.proto file will be used to generate the necessary Python files that will be used to interact with the um, port. That's how gRPC works, guys. Okay, that's how. That's why we are going through all of these steps. So again, this feed engine is running on port 9000. We're gonna need the gRPC tools to interact with this feed engine and supply commands, upload files. Eventually, we're gonna need to have the shell. So for gRPC, we're gonna need to create the proto. The proto file here laser.proto we follow the example laid down here and of course don't forget to read through the introduction to grpc here to get yourself familiar with the uh, uh, framework here 
But don't forget the protocol. But don't forget that this video is not about a gRPC, so we cannot explain every single step in detail, okay? Because otherwise, we can have to run a full video tutorial on how gRPC works. So, but it's enough to understand, guys, that gRPC allows you to communicate uh, with a server or with a client, even if the server or the client runs on different language or runs a different language. But to be able to do that, we're going to have to create first a proto file and then generate the necessary Python files that will be used to create the client. So here we have the proto file. Next, we're going to have to generate the uh, Python files. So we follow this command. After we install the gRPC tools, we execute this command. We supply the laser.proto and we're going to be able to generate the necessary Python files that will be used to as you can see, create the client. Now, how are we going to create this client to interact with the server? Now we have the proto file. Okay. We have the uh, necessary Python files. We install the gRPC tools. Okay. Now tell me how to interact with this with server running on port 9000. How to run this client? How to create this client? So basically, there is a tutorial again on gRPC official website on how to create a client. So basic tutorials. First, as you can see, let's let me show you the code and match the code with this tutorial. So let's scroll down and open up the client. So first we import the laser pp2 gRPC and pp2. What are these? These are the Python files, the library files we have generated, as you can see here. The names might be different depending on the name that you have chosen for the proto file. So basically, after we have generated the Python files, we're going to need to import them to the client script. And when we import gRPC, we have just installed Base64 and Pickle. All right. So as you can see here, guys, the first is goes the message. Here, the request that we will send to the server. Before we send the request to the server, um, as you can see, this is the IP address of the um, uh, my machine. Okay, this is the IP address of my machine. And this is the port 8099. Now, why I put my machine here? Because I want to see how the request looks like if I send it to my machine. Let's go back to the tutorial. So, creating a client, generating client and server code. Okay. All right. Request streaming RPC, creating desktop. So creating here, start, it starts from here, creating the client. You can see the example, complete example code client or the example client code here. This is an example client code. Okay. Now from here, as you can see, first we need to create a channel and stop. Going back to my machine. As you can see, this is a channel and this is the stop. Now, as you can see, guys, the channel should be the IP address or the host name of the printer. So the host name is printer.laserinternal.htp9000. Why I chose this? Why I didn't choose the IP address? Because that's how it is mentioned here in the documentation. Right? Look at this. This is the feed URL and this is the homepage URL. All, as you can see, used with the uh, host name. So we have to use the host name here. All right, now, if we run this script, what's going to happen? First, it's going to interact with my machine on port 8099, and then it's going to interact with the printer on port 9000. So let's go back and see this sample interaction. Let's see, skip to the line where the script worked. Okay, so what I did, I had, as you can see here, netcat running on port 8099 to test the connection to the server so i first forwarded the connection to my machine on port 8099 and as you can see when i run this uh yeah here when i run this i received the request and i was able to connect to the printer which means now i am able to interact with the server on the service on port 9000 all right, so how to take it, what, what to do from here? Now, we built a client, 
according to the gRPC tools to interact with the servers running on port 9000 that is feed engine okay now mission succeeded what to do now the next thing we, we had to do or we guessed we had to do is to do port scanning so the same script here we can convert this one into a port scanner so why port scanner because since we can interact with the server on port 9000 we can queue or we can probe for other ports so that's the scanner the same libraries we're going to import we can define a variable to include all the ports we want to scan we're going to run a for loop to loop through the ports and then we're going to use as you can see the local host ping the local host on these ports if we get a positive response it means that the port is open if we don't get a positive response it means the port is not open how do we know that the the, the response is positive as you can see going back to the documentation when we send a request to the server on port 9000 as you can see if we get pushing feeds in the output it means that we get a positive result or successful data transmission in this case it means the port is open this is the IP address of the machine and this is the port 9000 so when we run this so let's see here scroll down scroll scroll down so when we run this as you can see we get port 89 83 it had feed pushing feeds so according to the documentation if we receive pushing feeds it means that the data transmission was successful which means that the port 89 83 is open so if we check this link we can see that port 8983 is associated with apache solar now apache solar is a highly reliable and scalable um, you can say it's software for apache so solar is software for apache used for searching and indexing huge amounts of data so if you have a huge amounts of data and you run web server or run Apache as a web server you can install Apache solar so that you can take advantage of the indexing and searching functionality of the solar to handle the huge loads of data so now we know that there is an Apache server an Apache solar server running on port 89.3 now the next step is to have a shell but how do you have a shell first we want to find out if this is vulnerable so again guys this is a typical step that you can take you have the version it's 1.4 so version 1.4 has an exploit published on exploit database how do we know of course search exploit these are basic steps guys so remote code execution but we have a problem the thing is we are limited in the way we interact with the server running on port 9000 so as we can as we saw earlier that the only way to interact with the uh, server running on port 9000 is by using gRPC client and using gRPC client we were able only to ping or send a request as we saw earlier so how are we gonna attempt to have a shell on this let's go with the exploit and find out a way to do that so as you can see here guys in this line the first request the exploit sends is to slash solar slash admin slash course and then after it sends that request it's going to let's scroll down see where it is okay so as you can see for each core to be self, self port solar self node yeah the config so it sent the request to slash solar slash config okay using the core that it has uh, found so with this request here it retrieves the list of cores and with every core it sends the request to the configuration in order to change it that's where we that's where we need to generate the payload as you can see this is the payload so by changing the configuration of a specific core we're going to be able to upload a reversal as per the exploit if you go back the exploitation or to the documentation sorry as you can see here i told you about this item number four merge or merge staging core to feed engine which means the core we want to interact with is 
the staging. So what we're going to do, we're going to create a small Python script. We're not going to need to, to use that exploit because it's not going to work, obviously. So we're going to need to take parts of that exploit and use it in a separate Python script. So let's go here and see where is that script. So basically, we import the necessary libraries and we create the necessary parameter. As you can see, the core will be staging as per this, the documentation. And then we define the host that we want to interact with. In this case, it's local host running on port 8983, means the Apache. And then we have Goofer. So why Goofer? Let's go to this documentation. So basically, as I told you guys, since there is no way to interact with this service running on port 9000 other than sending couple requests using gRPC clients, we need a separate protocol to send the reverse shell. So Gopher offers this functionality or enables us to bypass the limitation we are currently uh, having. So as you can see, as per the documentation, it's designed for distributing, searching and retrieving documents in internet protocol networks. The design of Gopher protocol and user interface is manual driven. Okay. Also, there are a couple tutorials on using Gopher. I'm going to put them in the video description. So, we're going to send the request to the Apache Solar running on port 8983 using Gopher because there is no other way. Okay, guys. Scrolling down to this line here, as you can see, the feed URL will be the URL we we have specified earlier as you can see this is the URL and don't forget that we have to mention slash solar and then we append the core the core will be staging and then slash config because in the exploit if you go back to the exploit you will see here the first request is sent to slash solar slash admin slash course to retrieve the course we don't need to perform this step because we already have the core which is staging we need this one this okay and then this is appended to this slash config so slash solar we put the core here and slash config and we perform the request the next thing is to define the payload so here this is the payload in my case i created one payload using msf venom so here it is shell.elf so we create a payload named um let's see here where is the payload i want to show you the line where i created the payload so you see the msf venom as you can see regular reverse shell that runs on linux okay we create the shell and then we make the script downloads the shell back here in this line okay we give it execution permissions and we execute the shell now after executing all of that what's going to happen we're going to we're going to retrieve the shell so going back to NC, running on port 4545, and if you run the script, as you can see, I encountered many errors while running the script. As you can see, most of the errors were on URL library. URL library was not working correctly, so I run the script finally on Python 2. I decided to use Python 2. So let me show, scroll down, 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 here. So I use Python 2, guys, to run the exploit. Don't forget to use Python 2 to run the script if you want to use it. And then we receive the shell on port 4545. And as you can see, guys, we first we stabilize the shell. The idea of the user is solar. And we are under slash opt solar server. We decide to grab the user flag. And this is the user flag. Now the next step that we're going to do guys is to stabilize the shell more. So what we're going to do, we're going to echo or add my public key. I generated the new set of keys here. In case you don't know how to use the, how to do that, let me show you the exact command. So SSH key generation. We're going to generate two pair of keys. One is public and the other one is private. And we will go to your home directory on your attacker machine, of course get the public key and this is the public key grab the public key and go back to the shell that you have just achieved put the public key under var solar.ssh authorized keys because that's where the folder exists or directory exists we add our public key here and we'll be able to log in 
as SSH. Let's scroll up here and show you the SSH session. Yeah, as you can see here, SSH-I, I specify my private key and username Solar and I logged in as Solar. So up until now, we are just stabilizing the shell. Okay. So next step is to perform privilege escalation. So we imported PSPY64. How to import this? You're going to need to run Python server on your machine as I did and download the PSPY64 to the temp directory. Once you do that, run PSPY64 and you will be able to see the, all the processes, the cron jobs, etc. So what we, note, what we notice here is a repeating pattern of couple commands. Let's, let me show you here. Scroll down, 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 down. Look at this, SSH pass dash P. So what is SSH pass dash P? It's a way to run an SSH or SCP, meaning to transfer, download, or upload files without the need to supply the password every time. So what to do with that? Use SSH pass and put the password in plain text. This is a very bad way to use SSH as a cron job or as a periodic uh, running script. So what it's going to do, it's going to log in to the SSH and upload, as you can see, use SSCP to upload this path into root. As you can see, it's there is a server that lives on this IP address. So the machine is uploading this directory to whatever exists on this IP on this directory. And then we have here, as you can see, the password now is kind of encrypted or um, redacted again we upload the same directory and here we have the same command scrolling down and as you can see every time the same command is repeating so it's kind of uploading files directories to a server living that lives on this ip address most probably this is a docker container this is only a guess as of this level Scrolling down, let's see here, what do we have? Same one. Look at this one. Also, it is downloading or uploading a script clear.sh into the Docker or the server on this IP address under the temp directory. So there is some sort of periodically running download and upload operations performed by ssh pass um, from the solar machine into the machine running on this ip address most probably this is a docker machine how we found uh, uh, out about this so as you can see now we have a plain text password so we took this password and we logged in so i use ssh on the same machine don't run this command on your attacker machine on the same machine because this is an IP address that's internal in the network. You cannot see the IP address, this IP address from your from your attacker machine, or you have to do port forwarding. Otherwise, you have to do port forwarding. So the exact same command ssh-p the password. Instead of downloading and uploading files, I use ssh command and logged in as root to this IP address mentioned here. So I ended up in a Docker container. So this means that we are running inside a Docker container and we talked a lot about Docker containers in the past videos. You can get back to the videos and find out how we're going to know that you are inside a Docker container. So ID, we are the root of the container, but there is nothing on the container. So what do we have to do here? We have somehow to exploit this mechanism. So the machine solar is the up uploading files to the Docker container from the solar machine then it uploads the script clear.sh where is that script let me highlight the script again where is that script come on scroll up so after this I don't know why it's not showing. Let me scroll back up. 
Anyway, guys, you saw it earlier. I highlighted the script, so it's uploading the clear sh again to the server. So what we have to do? Maybe if we stop the SSH server, so the Docker container has an SSH server running. If we stop it, okay, we're gonna stop the procedure of uploading the files from the solar machine to the Docker. That's the first step. So we stopped SSH server running on the Docker container. And next, we're going to have to forward or perform some sort of port forwarding. Why? Because the only way to have a root shell on the solar machine is to exploit or to take advantage of the script clear.sh. So we're going to have to create our own version of a clear.sh and let the machine solar between parentheses executed. To do that, we're going to have to prevent Solar Machine from continuously, as you can see here, uploading the files into the Docker container. So here, scrolling down. Okay. Let's see here. So we stop the service, service SSH stop, and then we run SOCAT. So how to find SOCAT? Basically, you can find a static version of SOCAT here. Download the version. Download this into your local machine. And then you can download, upload this to the solar machine. How to do that? Launch a new session. Let me show you. I know those are basic steps. You should know how to do it yourself. But I'm going to show them again. So we log in again in a separate instance to the solar machine. And we go to the temp directory and we upload SOCAT. As you can see here, um, using wget. No, this is a clear message. Anyway, so here, ls. So I have SOCAT here. By running a Python web server and use wget, you're going to need, you need, you're going to be able to upload the SOCAT to the solar machine. Okay, let's go back now. Alternatively, you can directly from the Docker container upload the SOCAT from my machine or from your attacker machine. Next, we're going to execute this command to create the port forwarding. Okay, so we stopped now the SSH servers running on the Docker to prevent the continuous download and upload of the, uh, the files, and then we perform the port forwarding. So next, after we have just done this, we create our own version of the clear.sh script. So that's the script. It's a, simply a privileged escalation script. So cat clear.sh. As you can see in this script, I copied or I created a copy of the bash shell into slash temp slash root and then give it execu execution permissions with suit bit set. I named the file root and now what we're going to do, we're going to transfer again this script, okay, using wget into the uh, machine. So here but make sure to transfer the clear.sh into the solar machine, not the Docker container, as you can see here. I downloaded a copy of the clear.sh into the laser machine and place it under temp. Why temp? Because again, guys, let me reiterate that um, as per the output of PSPY, the root is copying the clear.sh from slash temp. Okay, so we have to place the script under the slash temp. Now this since this is running periodically, okay, what's going to happen? It's going to execute this clear sh. And now you wait a bit and then you go to temp directory of um, laser machine. After a while you can you can see the root file has been created. This is the root file again. I know you have. I know you are confused now. It's the file that we created from clear.sh. Okay, and then simply by executing or by issuing dot root or dot slash root dash p, we're going to have an 
a new shell as root and then retrieve the root flag I know it's a hard machine guys make sure to check out all of the links that I'm going to put in the video description the bottom line of this machine is how to interact with the feed engine running on this port 9000 and the fact that it needs the grpc tools to enable this interaction so this is kind of a new idea it was a new idea to me um, I hope this was helpful guys and I'm gonna see you later